Welcome to the SIGGRAPH 2020 course on Advances in Monte Carlo Rendering. My name is Alexander Keller and I'm a Director of Research at NVIDIA. This year's course is special as it is in commemoration of Jaroslav Krivanek. Jaroslav Krivanek has been an outstanding and highly respected researcher of the rendering community who passed away far ahead of his time. Through his numerous contributions to light transport simulation, he managed to profoundly influence an entire domain of academia and industry. In this course, we therefore will recap many important contributions of Jaroslav's career, underlining the practicality and pointing out how they all were consequent steps to finding the one robust light transport simulation algorithm that would efficiently render any given scene. Rarely has a single person had such an impact. We believe it is worth remembering and continuing the legacy of Jaroslav Krivanek. Before we dive in, please note that we have a web page for this course. Its link will be displayed on the last slide of the presentation. Also note that in the PDF of this presentation, all references are links that can be clicked. Teaching is certainly one important part of Yaroslav's legacy. And in this introduction to the course, I will give some exemplar evidence of the impact of the SIGGRAPH courses that Yaroslav had been part of or that he was organizing. His first course was on practical global illumination with irradiance caching, an algorithm that had a large part of the rendering industry kept busy at that time. Irradiance caching provided a way to speed up global illumination computations by sharing irradiance computations when appropriate. The possibility of sharing had been determined by similarity heuristics. Invented by Greg Ward, Yaroslav with Pascal Codron investigated the algorithm, provided a profound understanding of its limitations, extended it accordingly and made it more practical. They also took the next step and investigated temporal coherence and image stability when computing multiple frames of an animation. It were exactly these heuristics that later were used in the weights of path bliss filtering, a technique that uses a weighted average to share the contribution C of light transport paths among multiple camera paths by averaging them. The limitation of that technique is the restriction of the heuristics to create only binary weights, as otherwise using the weighted average may increase variance. At this year's SIGGRAPH, this limitation of path reuse has been lifted by introducing continuous multiple importance sampling. Instead of a weighted average, the contributions of n light transport paths are shared in the query camera path Y by combining the contribution FL of each light path segment CI divided by the sum of the probabilities of having generated the light path segment given that its camera path segment would have been YJ. This is the first example of Yaroslav's impact over multiple years. For the second example, I like to go back to the 2012 course on optimizing realistic rendering with many light methods. Many lights had been identified as a challenge and numerous approaches to the problem were around. Yaroslav with his collaborators focused on deep understanding, making the algorithms practical already, including the aspects of scalability and real-time rendering. At that time, Yaroslav invited me to talk about instant radiosity, a simple algorithm that traced a set of light transport paths to create what later has been named virtual point light sources. Using this point cloud, global illumination can be simply computed by adding up the contributions of all virtual point lights visible from the point to be shaded. An issue is that the geometry term needed to be clipped or bounded by V in order to avoid overmodulation due to the inverse squared distance in case the point to be shaded and the virtual point light are too close. As it turns out, this limitation was easy to get rid of. Clipping the geometry term is compensated by adding back the clip part of the reflection integral, however, now integrated over the hemisphere to avoid the weak singularity. Simply speaking, the missing part is acquired by scattering array into the hemisphere. 
This in fact makes a heuristic for multiple importance sampling, a heuristic that instead of combining multiple sampling techniques just partitioned the domain of integration. As you may already guess, Yaroslav with his co-workers extended multiple importance sampling in their way. Going beyond what Veach introduced in 1996, they came up with foundational improvements to multiple importance sampling over 20 years after the original work. In this year's SIGGRAPH, a part of Yaroslav's vision comes true. Scalable real-time rendering of many lights is a reality in spatio-temporal reservoir resampling for real-time ray tracing with dynamic direct lighting. Besides practice, Yaroslav very successfully drove rendering and Monte Carlo methods theory. In fact, produ production rendering companies were highly interested in Yaroslav's algorithms and he had been sharing his work all over the industry in addition to academia. Rendering algorithm research reached a new level by exploring more abstract approaches and unification. As a brief example, let's take a look at the reflection integral formulated as integration over the hemisphere. Its formulation over the surface dV has been known for long and is the basis of algorithms as the aforementioned multiple importance sampling. New then was the formulation of photon mapping in integral form. Whenever a photon hit sufficiently close to a point of query x, it was included in the computation. To make this technique consistent, the radius r had to go to zero. In the limit, this amounts to the surface integral. Pathways filtering is a generalization of integration over the solid angle. If a contribution of incident light in x prime is sufficiently close to x, it may be shared. Again, in the limit, this technique is consistent. Besides theory, half the course had been dedicated to practitioners, meaning making the algorithm real. Besides solid angle, Pixar and X limit technologies, Andre Kalik presented the Corona renderer, which is all about usability. Together with Yaroslav and Adam Hotovi, the Corona renderer later on became commercial. This was at a tipping point in rendering industry. The path tracing revolution in movie industry was about to happen, replacing complicated rendering algorithms with lots of parameters to optimize by the push button paradigm. The new generation of renderers had only a minimal set of parameters, which resulted in a much improved usability and robustness, not to speak of the much better image quality by physically based rendering. In 2014, Yaroslav student Yeri Vorba and team presented the online learning of parametric mixture models for light transport simulation. Core of the algorithm was that light transport simulation could be made more efficient by learning which light transport paths were important. This seminal article caused an avalanche of articles on machine learning and rendering, which became subject of the 2018 SIGGRAPH course. Work that followed showed that in fact reinforcement learning and light transport simulation follow the same integral equation. All that needed to be done was guiding paths towards the light sources. This was as simple as learning where the light came from. It is worth a note that the data structures were very similar to Evaridin's caching. Even the similarity heuristics were similar. It actually was only a small tweak in the old algorithms to unleash a whole new level of improved performance. All the related techniques were termed path guiding. Besides the classic data structures, neural importance sampling was released in the 2018 course and it showed that in fact neural networks were capable of efficient path guiding. They even can replace the classic data structures to approximate radiance, which in turn enabled neural control variants in light transport simulation. As mentioned before, the path tracing revolution changed the movie industry, and following the 2015 SIGGRAPH course, the production rendering companies described their technologies in depth in a seminal special issue of the ACM Transactions on Graphics. 2018, Yaroslav called for a course on the other kind of industrial rendering, the realistic rendering in architecture and product visualization. In fact, 
renderers for architectural, automotive, and product visualization are based on design decisions that are very different from production rendering. Yaroslav made the fact public by juxtaposing this technology to rendering for motion pictures and pointing out the most significant differences as described in the course's abstract. The abstract also states that relatively little attention in the communication at SIGGRAPH is dedicated to such rendering technologies and the presentations in the course make the case. Yaroslav and myself plan to propose an ACM transaction on graphic special issue complementary to the production rendering special issue. In that sense, I'd like to recommend checking Yaroslav's presentation on open problems and research directions as it still serves as vision and guideline for future research. Now let me introduce the presenters of this course. Besides myself, Pascal Gautron and Yeri Boba helped with the organization of the course and will present their research with Yaroslav. We then have Ilian Georgiev, Martin Sick, and Eugène Dion, who were close collaborators of Yaroslav, of course. Last but not least, there are Ivo Kondapanini, Pascal Gridman, and Peter Weboda to share their part of science with Yaroslav. Yaroslav's research aimed at finding the one robust and efficient light transport simulation algorithm that would handle any given scene with any complexity of transport. He had a clear and unique vision of how to reach this ambitious goal. On his way, he created an impressive track of significant research contributions that you will find on his webpage. I would like to start this course with a few words about my dear friend Yaroslav. Most of us have known or heard of him through his research publications, his presentations. He started his research career back in the early 2000s at the Czech Technical University. There he was working on ray tracing optimization. From his master thesis to late 2019, he produced an amazing amount of research, all the while learning, teaching, and he had always his mix of scientific rigor and this delightful lightness. His scientific achievements have shaped the current landscape of rendering research. You can find many resources and talks from him on the web, but in this presentation, I would like to talk not that much about science, I would like to tell you how an amazing person he was. I had the chance of meeting Yaroslav back in 2003. I was finishing my master's and he was in his first year of PhD at the University of Rennes, France. I came for an interview for a PhD position with the same director as Yaroslav's, Kadi Boatouche. He wanted to build a collaboration with Sumant Patanaik at the University of Central Florida. So they decided to send us both to Orlando just a couple of months later. That was our first experience in the US. There we discovered an amazing graphics team and the joys of Florida. We had some funny critters appearing in our rooms. We had mosquitoes, so alligators, just to name a few things. In our group of students, we dubbed Yaroslav the walking encyclopedia, as he always seemed to have a sensible answer to any question, any problem we would throw at him. Together, we learned computer graphics research, multilingual karaoke, we discovered the SIGGRAPH world and its parties, and we met wonderful researchers from all around the world. For my part, I felt he was always several steps ahead of me. He mentored me for most of my PhD while doing his own research. Discussion around beers quickly turned into papers and frankly, I owe him a lot of my research contributions of those years. From a personal standpoint, Yaroslav was as open to new ideas as he was in his research. I think free spirit would have been a perfect definition of his way of life no chains or ideas would ever hold him back. All the while, he would be 
making friends all around the world, always in peace. In research, as in real life, no challenge would be too big for him. He could look at it, think of what to do, and go for it. Sometimes he would have a plan, sometimes not. Most often, the mix of plans and improvisation, but he would always end up achieving what he wanted. And the magic of it is that he could do that while never taking himself seriously. A nice example of this is the high conference that he co-organized with Martin Chadik, that's also in this picture. This conference gathers a happy bunch of mostly Czech and Slovak researchers somewhere in the mountains, and the days are spent halfway doing high-quality research presentations, and the other half is fun outdoors activities. Jaroslav loved many things, among which traveling by any mean of transportation necessary. One of his favorites was hitchhiking. During our PhDs, he could hitchhike the whole 1,400 kilometers from Prague to Rennes. In Florida, he could simply decide one evening to go from Orlando to the beach, jump in the first car that would stop, and see where to go. He would always come back with adventures to tell, including some people making hours-long detours to take him where he wanted, to the Daytona police, kindly bringing him to a drive-in church, where he could hitch a new ride. Along his trips, he would never say no to a new experience, even when the food may bite back. He also loved music, and especially in the last years, could dedicate more time to playing guitar and singing. Lately, he also discovered a passion for theatre, and was part of an amateur theatre group. In general, Jaroslav was always in for anything life would send him. Any new experience, new encounter, it was worth it. He would go all in, with the enthusiasm of a child. I find this photo summarizes him very well. I remember meeting that tall, simple, and smiling guy with his solar spirit shining on everybody he would meet. He would always be open for an adventure in the name of science, in the name of fun, ideally both. He was very generous, kind, and attentive to everybody's feelings. If the expression larger than life fits anybody, it definitely fits him. When Jaroslav passed away on this dreadful December 1st, 2019, he left a hole in our hearts that will never fill up. Science has lost one of its most talented researchers, and mankind has lost a wonderful human being. In those last years, our busy lives made us constantly postpone spending time together. At each conference, we would decide to take a few days soon to meet outside of work, either in Berlin or in Prague or anywhere. This is a painful reminder of the importance of enjoying the presence of the people we care about while we still can. Even though he took his final bow far ahead of his time, part of him is still with us. When he passed away, his girlfriend Angeliki was pregnant. She gave birth to little Alexei Yaroslav on March 11, 2020. He's called Mikros by his grandma. On this day, I would like to tell them how sorry I feel for their loss. I would also like to tell Alexei how wonderful his father was. Goodbye, Yaroslav, Yada, Yaro. You will always shine in our hearts. Farewell, my friend. Au revoir, mon ami. We will start the technical part of the course by a return to the origins. Yaroslav and I started our PhDs working on the irradiance and radiance caching algorithms, and that kind of shaped also a lot of the uh, algorithms that he's been developing later on. At that time, we're talking about early 2000s, global illumination was not so widespread in the industry. Pretty often, we'd compute only direct lighting, and 
where shadows get, were getting too dark, we would add some fake light sources to simulate the GI. So it was a lot of artist work. So we are pretty far from current state-of-the-art rendering engines like the Corona render that Yaroslav Cope wrote. In this image, you can see that we are seeing nearly only indirect lighting with pretty complex light path. 32 years ago, Yeridan's caching was trying to address indirect diffuse interreflections. And Greg Ward made the observation that the indirect lighting tends to vary relatively slowly over surfaces, so there should be a way to sparsely sample and interpolate this indirect lighting. Yeridan's caching is based on three main pillars. The first one is this sparse sampling, so we can compute Iridian's records at a number of locations in the scene and reuse them within spheres of influence around each of them. We can extrapolate the lighting and interpolate the lighting, if ever, to spheres of influence overlap. How do we compute this size of this sphere of influence? This is provided by the so-called split sphere model. If we imagine our record is located at the center of a sphere that's half completely dark, half completely bright. Then, how, how can we quantize the mistake that we'll be making if ever we would reuse this irradiance value a bit farther away on the surface? If the user provides a, a threshold in the error that we can afford in the image, then we can use this metric to define a radius of influence around each point. Once we can compute the irradiance and decide where it should be reused, we need to be able to store and retrieve that information. And the irradiance caching paper proposed to store that in an oak tree that is refined on the fly. This is an early picture from the original paper showing the irradiance record locations in blue. And we can see that it adapts to the places where the lighting tends to vary slowly over here on flat surfaces, and for example, around corners where lighting varies faster, then we generate more samples. This is all provided by this split sphere model that's heavily dependent on the distance to visible objects. If we just reuse the irradiance within a sphere of influence and do that for all records, then we can end up with pretty interesting artifacts, as you can see here. The irradiance gradients proposed by Ward and Hegbert in 92 were trying to address that issue by introducing gradients, so direction variation of the irradiance inside a record, and that provides a lot smoother results. Those gradients are based on the way we sample the hemisphere. In this paper, in the irradiance caching paper in general, we use a stratified sampling, and in the original paper, it's a cosine weighted stratified sampling. And the idea is to have a look at the walls of a given stratum and try to compute how the walls would move if we would rotate a little bit the normal or if we would translate a little bit our point. For rotations, the computation is completely straightforward because it's basically only a change in the cosine term. But for translations, then we have the parallax effect that comes into play. So nearby objects will tend to move faster relatively to the point than more distant objects. So the resulting formula is pretty involved and very dependent on the sampling that we use. That was the state of the art when we started our PhDs. And the first thing uh, Yaroslav was working on is what to do with glossy surfaces. If we don't simulate GI at all, then we end up with only direct lighting that really does not give a good idea of what the material of this flamingo is. Here we absolutely don't realize it's actually made of gray metal. If we want to reuse ideas from Uranus caching for glossy surfaces, we will most likely have to have a look at gradients because the indirect lighting may change slowly or not on the, on the surfaces, depending on glossiness. There's also a pretty big problem for the robustness of Uranus caching in general, 
is some errors in sampling and light leaking. Sampling because sometimes the radius of influence is not well estimated, depending, for example, if some samples miss some critical geometry. And also the light leaking is very present in the corners of the scene, especially if the scene is not properly modeled or just because of floating point errors. Some uh, rays can end up leaking through corners and then having a very long radius, which in turn creates this kind of artifacts because if the geometry that we see is very far, then the record tends to have a very large sphere of influence and nearly no contribution. That's why we see all those darker spots over there. Yaroslav's work has been centered a lot on trying to find a robust algorithm that would be able to simulate all kinds of light transport. And even though it was just the beginning, that was already the approach he had. And we had on one side the irradiance caching algorithm that was working well enough on diffuse surfaces. And on very glossy surfaces, path tracing is really converging really fast. So his idea was, let's bridge the gap and propose something that will work everywhere in between. So we will have the full spectrum of glossiness that we can simulate. To do this, we started from the same approach as the original irradiance caching, that is, indirect lighting tends to vary relatively slowly over surfaces, so we can sparsely sample and interpolate our lighting. Of course, if we are talking about glass surfaces, it means we have view dependence. Depending where we look at the, at the object, then the reflection will change. In a nutshell, this glossiness is tied to the BRDF, the bidirectional reflectance distribution function, that represents for one incoming light direction how the light will be scattered in all other directions. If the surface is diffuse, then the surface reflects light similarly in all directions. The glossier it gets, the more a lobe appears with one favorite reflection direction, up to a perfect mirror that would have a very, very narrow lobe. This is, of course, a very reduced way of seeing materials, and I would really encourage you to uh, have a look at some more literature if you're interested in material modeling. But for the purposes of radiance caching, that's about all we need. Spherical harmonics are very good functions, basis functions to represent any function on the hemisphere. So it can be seen as the equivalent of DCT or any Fourier transform, but on the hemisphere. And those are the first basis functions that are represented here. And those functions have a lot of interesting properties. First one is that as any Fourier transform, we can represent any function, for example, our BRDF, by computing the dot product between this BRDF and each basis function. And that will give us a number of coefficients representing our function. To be exact, of course, we would need an infinity of coefficients, but since we are talking about only moderately glassy surfaces, then we can get away with a limited number of coefficients. We use the 100, typically. If we want to evaluate a function for a given direction, we just need to compute the dot product between the vector of coefficients on one hand and the basis functions evaluated for that direction on the other hand. If we need to rotate, a function projected in spherical harmonics, then we can efficiently compute a sparse rotation matrix that will give us the rotated coefficients. If that's still too slow, Yaroslav came up with a fast approximation for spherical harmonics rotation that would gain a lot of time. In computer graphics, we very often want to compute the dot product of two functions, the reflectance and the incoming radiance. Good news are that the spherical harmonics can be used to project on one side the BRDF, on the other side the incoming radiance. When we want to compute the dot product of the two functions, we just have to compute the dot product of the vectors of coefficients. To interpolate two projected functions like this, we will first rotate each function into the frame of the point at which we want to interpolate, and then just perform a linear blending between each coefficient. If we just reuse 
the radiance functions in space around our record, then the reflections will be very wrong. And it's already visible with irradiance caching, but with radiance caching, that really makes it very obvious. So for that, Yaroslav needed to derive some new gradients that will be adapted to glossy surfaces so that we can actually reflect the change of reflections in the, in the surfaces. That's an example of what we obtain between no gradients and what we should obtain. The idea is pretty similar to the one of uh, irradiance gradients in the sense that we're also talking about uh, stratification and trying to compute how the walls move with translation. However, this approach is not only independent from the stratification that we use, but it also integrates the basis functions at its core. So from that, we can compute the wall movement for each cell. And from that wall movement, adjust the, the cosine terms depending on the distances from the surrounding objects and deduce the change of incoming radiance for each cell of the stratification. If we sum it all together and weight it by the basis function, then we obtain the gradient for each coefficient. And this is the kind of result we can obtain where we can see that the reflections or all those parts of that sphere are properly computed. Another problem was the robustness of irradiance caching and radiance caching as well, and could even be more visible with radiance caching. The first one is that sometimes we don't estimate the radius of influence right. For example, our samples just missed a surrounding object and then we may overestimate the size of the record. Another possibility, as we saw before, is that some rays can leak under surfaces, triggering the creation of very large records with completely erroneous values. In both cases, it's pretty hard if we look only at one record to know exactly what's going on. But Yaroslav came up with two deceptively simple techniques to solve those cases. The first one is that we can look when we extrapolate the incoming radiance function at two records to get the value in the middle, we can compare those extrapolations from P1 and P2 if the difference is too large, it means we have a problem and we should increase our sampling rate in that area. So we reduce the radius of each of those records so that the algorithm can trigger the creation of a record in between. A similar idea is uh, applied to removing those erroneous records. We're never completely sure if the value is completely erroneous or not, so uh, we don't want to discard completely a record when it's there. But we know by construction that it's not possible to trigger the construction of a record inside the validity radius of another one. So if ever one record gets so big that it encompasses the center of another record, then it means there's a problem with that one. So we reduce it in size so that it respects our construction constraints and doesn't overlap the sample of its neighbor. And that allows us to reduce a lot those artifacts in the corners. We've been also working on implementing radiance caching on graphics hardware. It was pretty limited uh, graphics hardware at the time, but we could convert the Octree searches by splitting and then apply all that within 96 instructions in the primary shader. If you're interested in yeah, radiance caching, there's a lot of resources. The first one being the book that Jaroslav and I wrote, where there's a ton of uh, tricks and tips on how to make irradiance caching actually robust. There are also some SIGGRAPH courses on, uh, on this subject. And most importantly, this work has been triggering a lot of further research that will be also illustrated in the next sections of this course. And on this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I will leave the stage to Ilian that will talk to you about sampling path. Hi, my name is Ilian, and in this section of the course, I'll cover a few rendering methods based on the theory of path sampling. Let me give you a brief overview of the talk. Realistic rendering methods simulate the transport of light along all possible trajectories or paths in the given scene. 
I'll first present a mathematical formalization of this problem and a few basic techniques for sampling paths. I'll then show how this formulation enables the combination of two classical bidirectional rendering methods into one robust algorithm and its extension to participating media. I'll wrap up with a method that carefully coordinates the sampling of path vertices to substantially reduce noise in media. Let's begin with some theory. The problem of computing the value of each image pixel can be expressed as a conceptually simple integral over the space of all paths that connect the light sources to the camera through an arbitrary number of bounces at surfaces or in media. This integral is rarely available in closed form, and therefore in practice we have to estimate it numerically, for example using Monte Carlo integration based on random path sampling. For each path, we evaluate its contribution and divide by its sampling probability density. Note that the only degree of freedom here is in the choice of the path sampling PDF. Different sampling methods, often called sampling techniques, can only differ in the PDFs they use. The contribution of each possible path is a product of a few terms. The camera sensitivity to light, the BSDF or phase function at each interior path vertex, the mutual orientation and transmittance between subsequent path vertices, and the emitted radiance at the last vertex. To minimize the variance of the resulting estimator, important sampling theory postulates the use of a sampling technique whose PDF is proportional to the path contribution function. But unfortunately, this is very difficult in practice due to the complex shape of this function, which is also scene dependent. Practical methods are based on simulating the natural flow of light instead. The most classical method starts from the camera, generates a ray through a given pixel, and samples a propagation distance with density proportional to the transmittance along the ray to determine the second path vertex. In the absence of media, this procedure deterministically finds the first visible surface along the ray. Then, a direction is sampled proportionally to the scattering distribution at that vertex. A new distance is sampled along the resulting ray, and the process continues until a light source is hit or if sampling is terminated via some algorithmic criterion. The complete path is then created as a series of local and distance and direction sampling decisions. It turns out that the PDF of this technique is proportional to the product of, of all terms in the path contribution except for the emission. It thus needs to randomly land on a light source to obtain a non-zero contribution and the probability of this happening depends on the size of the light sources. It can thus perform poorly when the sources are relatively small, which is common in practical scenes. We could important sample the emission by instead starting the sampling at the light source. However, this would require finding the camera via random sampling, which is typically even harder as its sensor is very small. Alternatively, we could start sampling at both ends simultaneously. One path from the camera and one from the light. A complete path is then constructed by connecting their endpoints. With this approach, the same path can be constructed in a number of different ways depending on the edge along which the connection is performed. The path can be sampled unidirectionally, starting from the light source, or by connecting along the first edge from the camera, or the second, and so on. A good, a good question is then, what is the difference between these many techniques? To gain some insight, uh, let's consider the case where two vertices are very close to each other. The contribution of this path can be arbitrarily high due to the inverse squared length of the edge between them that appears in the geometry term. The technique that connects along that edge will produce a very large estimate for this path. It does not important sample the geometry term because the two subpaths are sampled independently from each other. Luckily, there is always a technique that connects along another edge where the geometry contribution does not explode. But every technique has its own failures. Ideally, we want to make use of all the available techniques and in a way that avoids all failure cases. To achieve this, we can use a framework called multiple important sampling. Given an integral and 
a few techniques, each with a, with a corresponding estimator. MIS provides a combined estimator as a weighted sum. The key to achieving low variance here is in the choice of the weighting function W. The balance heuristic is a prov provably good choice which weighs techniques proportionally to their sampling density or equivalently inversely proportionally to their estimates. Leveraging the power of MIS, the bidirectional path tracing algorithm considers all possible connection techniques and combines them via the balance heuristic to preserve the advantages of each. And here's a comparison to the commonly used in practice unidirectional sampling with additional light source connections, uh, which is a subset of the full bidirectional algorithm. With more techniques at its disposal, the full algorithm can find a good mixture and render the complex lighting in this scene efficiently, including the detailed caustics on the table. But if we zoom in mo more closely, we see that the reflections of those caustics in the mirror are completely missing from the image. The reason is that none of the many available techniques can, sup can sample those light paths efficiently. This is often referred to as the problem of insufficient techniques. So there's more work to be done here. In summary, the path integral formulation provides a view of light transport that considers the pixel contributions of entire tra trajectories connecting emitters and receivers. The only difference between methods is in the techniques they employ to construct paths. This framework enables the efficient combination of different techniques via MIS, as well as the use of advanced techniques like joint sampling and Markov chain Monte Carlo. In the rest of this talk, I'll focus on technique combinations and joint sampling, and fellow speakers will talk more about these and Markov chain methods after me. We'll now see how to leverage the path integral framework to address the problem of insufficient techniques by bringing techniques from photon mapping into bidirectional path tracing. Let's focus on those missing, missing reflected caustics again. Photon mapping can render those caustics very efficiently, but looking more closely, we see that it has issues with the glossy reflections on the table and the distant diffuse lighting in the scene. And what we want is a combination of these two methods, which complement each other in the types of effects they can handle efficiently. Let's see how to achieve this. Well, bidirectional path tracing and photo mapping have traditionally been considered as incompatible solutions to the light transport problem. This is due to the different mathematical frameworks they've been originally formulated in. Bidirectional path tracing as Monte Carlo estimation of the path integral, and photon mapping as a photon density radiance estimator. The key idea to combining these methods is to formulate them in the same framework. The path integral is the obvious choice here as it already subsumes bidirectional path tracing and allows technique combination via MIS. So this means we need to formalize a path sampling technique corresponding to photon mapping and derive its probability density function. So let's see how these two methods construct a simple path. In bidirectional path tracing, we sample two subpaths and connect their endpoints. We call this technique vertex connection. With the same configuration in photon mapping, we sample one more vertex on the light subpath. We have a non-zero contribution if that new vertex lands within some distance r from the i subpath endpoint. The PDF of vertex connection is simply the product of the PDFs of the two subpaths, which are sampled independently. For photo mapping, a straightforward in interpretation again corresponds to the product of the two subpath PDFs. Uh, but the issue with this interpretation is that the two techniques sample paths with different number of vertices, and thus their path PDFs have different measures. And this prevents a meaningful combination via MAS, which expects the PDFs to have the same measure. Hachiska and colleagues address this issue by embedding vertex connection into the higher dimensional space of photon mapping, considering a virtual perturbation of the I subpath endpoint before connecting it to the light subpath. When this is done with uniform density with radius r, the PDF of the perturbed vertex is the, equal to the inverse area of the corresponding disk. Alternatively, we can stick with the original vertex connection definition 
and interpret photon mapping as performing the same vertex connection, but conditioning its acceptance on the random event that the photon vertex lands within distance r from the green i sub path endpoint. And this puts photon mapping into the lower dimensional space of bidirectional path tracing. The path PDF is then equal to the vertex connection PDF, but additionally multiplied by the acceptance probability. Assuming that the photon vertex PDF is constant within an R neighborhood, this probability can be approximated by the PDF of the sample vertex and the disk area. We call this technique vertex merging as it can be thought of virtually welding the photon and query points if they're close enough. And now that we have compatible PDFs, we can combine these techniques via MIS. It's interesting to note that both this and the extended vertex connection interpretation from the previous slide result in the same MIS weights when the PDFs are plugged into the balance heuristic. Before describing the combined algorithm, let's see what techniques we have at our disposal. Bidirectional path tracing has two ways of sampling a path with five, with five vertices unidirectionally, four ways by vertex connection, and vertex merging brings five new ways corresponding to merging at the five vertices. Uh, however, in practice, we don't use the techniques that merge at the endpoints. The combined algorithm proceeds in two stages. In the first stage, we trace paths from the light sources, connect their vertices to the eye, and build a range search data structure over those vertices. In the second stage, we trace a ray through every pixel, connecting the hit point to all the vertices of a light subpath, and try to merge it with the vertices of all light subpaths. We then continue the eye subpath and perform connection and merging recursively. Similarly to the scene I showed earlier, bidirectional path tracing struggles with some complex caustic paths in this scene. Photo mapping handles those paths relatively well, but fails at others. The combined algorithm takes the best of both to produce a clean image in the same amount of render time. And here's a visualization of the relative contributions of vertex connection and merging techniques to each pixel. We see that overall, the two contribute about the same, but in some parts of the image, one set of techniques is preferred over the other. To summarize, formulating photo mapping as a path sampling technique enables its efficient combination with bidirectional path tracing, and this combination handles complex lighting more robustly than its ingredients on their own. As an added benefit, the combined algorithm also inherits the higher error convergence rate of bidirectional path tracing. However, an MIS combination can be at most as good as the best available technique, and none of the techniques here is particularly efficient in sampling inter-reflections between highly glossy surfaces. Handling this remains an open problem in this framework. And now let's see how the same ideas can be transferred to participating media to combine even more techniques. Media can have widely varying properties. They can have high or low scattering albedo. They can be optically dense or sparse. And they can exhibit diffuse or spectral lighting. Ideally, we want a single algorithm that can efficiently render all these various cases. In addition to bidirectional path tracing, there are many available photon density estimation techniques for media. These can be classified by the type of primitive used for radiance representation, points or beams, and the query type, again, point or beam. Four types of estimators can be derived from these, point point, beam point, point beam, and beam beam. In practice, we don't use the beam point estimator as it performs similarly to the point beam estimator, but is less computationally efficient. To get some intuition about points and beams, here's a simple scene illuminated by a point light. Here's the result from using 100,000 photon points and 5,000 photon beams. It seems that we don't need to consider points since they ca that can be beaten by a much smaller number of beams. However, 
While in optically sparse media this is indeed the case, beams do outperform points, in the case of dense media, points in fact outperform beams. And of course, we always want to use the best available estimator in each case. And to be able to leverage MIS, we need to derive a path PDF for each estimator, which is done similarly to the photon mapping case. I'll spare you the details here and I'll directly outline the resulting combined algorithm. We begin by tracing a number of paths from the light sources and connect their vertices to the eye. We store these vertices as photon points and the segments as photon beams. In the second stage, we trace a ray through each pixel and query the photon points along the ray and also the photon beams. After that, we sample a scattering distance along the eye ray and connect the resulting vertex to a light subpath and then query the surrounding photon points. Finally, we extend the path and repeat the process recursively. Now let's see how this algorithm performs. After an hour of rendering, bidirectional path tracing and the photon points and beams estimators remain noisy in different parts of the image, while their MIS combination manages to produce a much cleaner image in the same amount of time. The result is similar on this scene, where the point beam estimator handles the dense media efficiently, while the beam beam estimator is better for the sparse fog. The combined method preserves the strength of the individual estimators. In summary, we saw that the various photon density estimators have complementary strengths, and that their MIS combination delivers more robust light transport estimation. However, similar to the case with photon mapping, this combination aims to minimize variance only, and it ignores the bias inherent in photon density estimation. Another drawback is that now that the number of techniques has grown so much, the practical implementation of the method is a bit more difficult, and oftentimes only a small subset of the techniques end up making significant contribution. Now, let's consider a different way to sample paths. Recall that unidirectional sampling can produce a lot of variance when the light sources in the scene are small. To render direct lighting more efficiently, we can directly sample a vertex on a light source, a propagation distance along the camera ray, and connect to that vertex. The distance is typically sampled proportionally to the transmittance along the ray, concentrating more points closer to its origin where the transmittance is high. But as we saw before, the contribution of the resulting path also includes the geometry term along the connection edge. And while the transmittance is bounded between 0 and 1, the inverse square distance is unbounded and is a source of extreme variance. So it makes sense to try import and sample the geometry term instead. Doing this concentrates the sampled points in regions along the ray where the distance to the light vertex is small. This technique is called equiangular sampling as the distribution of angles between the ray and the connecting segment is uniform. As we see in this comparison, equiangular sampling can be a lot more efficient than transmittance sampling when the light source is embedded in the media. The technique can be used for light source connections along any path segment to render higher or order scattering. To see how this performs, here's an image rendered with light source connections via tr classical transmittance sampling and equiangular connections. Here, there's a no noticeable noise reduction, especially in regions around the light sources. However, a lot of noise remains, with some pixels having extreme values. Even if we have important sample the geometry term along the ray, there remains geometric singularity in the angle of the ray direction, and that direction is still sampled according to the local phase function independently from the location of the light source vertex. And this is the issue with the classical approach of local importance sampling. 
It prescribes the sampling decisions of the individual vertices based on local scattering properties, without explicit control over the path PDF, which is the joint distribution of all vertices on the path. And the path integral framework provides a global view of light transport, which actually gives us a mechanism to explicitly control the joint sampling distribution. This works by first prescribing the joint PDF and then deriving the conditional PDFs for the individual vertices one by one by marginalizing that given joint. The specific problem we consider here is constructing a path with four vertices, given a ray from the camera and a point on a light source. We want to sample the two interior vertices by prescribing a joint PDF that is proportional to the product of all geometry terms along the path. When we marginalize this joint, we get that the first vertex along the camera ray should be sampled proportionally to the inverse distance to the light vertex. For the scattering direction at that vertex, we obtain a PDF that cancels the angular singularity. And the propagation distance that finally determines the second vertex should be sampled proportionally to the inverse squared distance to the light, which is again the equiangular PDF. Chaining these sampling routines results in the desired joint distribution. In anisotropic scattering media, we also want to include the phase function into the joint. Analytical marginalization of the joint is not possible in this case, but luckily a compact tabulation is still possible by exploiting various symmetries in the geometric configurations. Now let's see how much of a difference this sampling makes in this isotropically scattering media. Here again are the images with transmittance and equiangular-based connections. Joint sampling reduces noise substantially and, importantly, eliminates all fireflies thanks to cancelling all singularities. We can also render higher-order scattering by using this technique to connect an ISA path to a light source with two intermediate vertices. It still brings noise reduction, though it doesn't fully cancel all the singularities. The improvement in anisotropically scattering media is even more visually striking as there the technique important samples all sources of significant variance, whereas the traditional approach important samples only the transmittance, which isn't a major source of variance in this scene. And there is still a significant improvement with higher order scattering. In summary, joint sampling provides a way to perform important sampling across bounces and cancels out singularities in the path contribution to bring substantial improvement over classical path tracing. However, higher order scattering remains challenging since marginalizing the corresponding joints is much harder. The technique also performs best when there are no surfaces in the scene and explicitly accounting for the surface scattering in the prescribed joint distribution seems difficult. And this concludes my part. Thank you for your attention. Welcome to the next part of the course on zero variance theory. In this part of the course, we'll cover some work that began when Yaroslav visited Weta Digital in 2013. We'll review some of the work that was published in the SIGGRAPH 2014 talk, as well as cover several results that Yaroslav and I never managed to publish until now. We set out to improve the efficiency of random walk subsurface transport in the context of a unidirectional path tracing algorithm. In this method, a random walk from the camera to the light source is generated. This result is very accurate, especially in curved regions or when the material properties vary within the volume. But it can be very costly because the paths can be long and it can take many paths until we get a completely converged result. The creation of these subsurface random walk paths involve sampling decisions in the volume consisting of BSDF sampling, there might be a rough dielectric material at the interface. We also have phase function sampling that determine the change of directions of the dashed path. And also free flight distance sampling that samples the length of each of the da dashed path segments. In the traditional or classical algorithm, each of these decisions is made independently with no notion of where the light source is or where the path as a whole should try to get to. If we revisit this path sampling algorithm in the context of something called zero-variance theory, 
then we can find new ways to make these individual sampling decisions such that the entire path is optimally sampled. Despite the nice theory, in practice, we can never really get to the truly zero variance estimator that would allow us to render all of our images with just one sample per pixel. But in practice, with a little bit of approximate information to guide our sampling, we can significantly reduce the variance of each estimator. In the 2014 SIGGRAPH talk, we showed how to use new simple functions for guiding phase function and distance sampling, such that in the same render time, uh, an object in general illumination has a lower variance per pixel. So let's look at how this method works, uh, how it relates to the zero variance theory, and how we can improve upon it. If we put gray translucent material under general illumination conditions and apply the classical sampling algorithm, we see variance in the pixel values for two reasons. One comes from the non-uniform lighting at the surface. Some paths come out and reach a light source with high contribution and others do not. The second source of variance comes from absorption within the medium. It's possible to do zero variance guiding that considers both of these properties at the same time. Uh, and Yuri will talk about that in the next section of the course. But right now, we're only going to focus on reducing the variance that's due to the subsurface absorption. So we're going to ignore the lighting at the surface and apply zero variance theory only to the subsurface subpath under the assumption that the material is homogeneous, um, that it's optically flat and thick. We're going to combine the guided estimator with multiple important sampling with a classical one to deal with the case when these assumptions don't hold perfectly. And then we'll let the path tracer do the rest to, to integrate the lighting portion of the signal. So you can think of this as zero variance to escape. Our goal here is simply to get out of the medium under the assumption that Everywhere on the surface and in all directions, we hope to find lighting information. A convex object in uniform lighting removes any variance due to the lighting part of the signal and shows us exactly what's left over due to absorption within the volume. And this is happening because uh, different paths of different lengths see different number of collisions in the material, each collision absorbing by some single scattering albedo, and then the total path throughput of a given sampled path is that I'll be due to some power n, where n is the number of collisions that we saw. Zooming in on a small flat patch of the object, we see significant absorption variance across the full range of albedos. Only in the case of the impossibly non-absorbing material do we have, for free, by classical sampling, a truly zero variance walk. For all other absorption levels, the guiding technique from 2014 gives a nice reduction in variance. So let's look at how it's derived from the theory. The zero variance theory typically writes about an intercollision kernel K that takes us from one place in phase space to another between collisions. We typically think of this as three separate parts, two independent sampling decisions, a phase function, capital P, that gives us some new direction after we leave a collision, a free flight distance, uh, P underscore C, that determines how far away our next collision should be, and implicit in this procedure is a 1 over r squared geometry term. And the fundamental equation of the zero variance theory is that the perfectly zero variance guided kernel is simply formed as the product of the classical unguided kernel k times some importance function w. And then we need to normalize this because we want the guided kernel to be a normalized set of decisions to make, and so it must normalize to 1. This importance function w follows from an adjoint transport equation, uh, and this is where the theory gets interesting in that this doesn't need to be exact for the theory to add value to your problem. So you can guess at this, you can make it approximate, plug something in here that you are able to normalize and product sample, and the better that your guess is, the closer your total path sampling will get to zero variance. Let's now apply the theory, except now we're not going to sample k in a single step, but we'll break it into its individual parts. And for each decision that we make, phase function or free flight distance or BSDF sampling, each of those decisions is going to follow the, the general rule that the guided distribution will always be the physical distribution times an appropriate importance function that matches that decision, and then we normalize that result. Let's start with a simple half space 
with isotropic scattering and no Fresnel effects at the boundary. And let's look at the first distance that we sample into the volume. We assume a classical volume exponential, so the free flight distance P of S is an exponential distribution that we typically sample with a simple log of 1 minus the random number. If we form our half space with optical depth x, we arrive at some direction given with cosine mu, and we sample some distance s into the medium, then we'll end up at depth x equals mu time s. And the final weight of our particle will be the previous weight before making this decision, which will be 1 in this case, because we're just arriving at the material, times the important sampling weight that we get from sampling a guided distribution instead of P of S unguided. And then this will be multiplied by the total future expected outcome of the walk that continues from the uh, event that we just sampled. So in this case, what is W? What's our importance function? It will be a gradient, which is the probability that we eventually escape after any number of future collisions after entering this collision at depth x, which we evaluate at mu s. And we want this final particle weight to be a constant so that the walk is zero variance. And this gives us the equation that we can solve for our guided distribution pg. And we see our pattern, which is that the zero variance result is always the normalization of the physics times the right uh, importance function. In this case, w doesn't depend uh, on the direction at which we enter the collision because of the isotropic scattering. So here we write it simply as a function of depth. But this guided sampling decision that we make is directionally dependent in the sense that it is evaluated um, based on the cosine that we're currently moving before we make this decision. The exact importance function that we need for our problem is known. However, it is a very complicated result. Fortunately, much of the solution is well approximated by a single exponential term that corresponds to the rigorous or asymptotic diffusion component of the full solution. The more complicated transient term is only important near the boundary and has little effect uh, when the absorption is low. Uh, we can't apply the full result in general because uh, the terms involved are incredibly complicated. The idea to guide the walk using only the asymptotic portion of the solution was inspired by a Duivity 1982 paper in Neutron Transport. We also note that essentially the same ideas appeared in several earlier works. All we require to apply this method is our exponential of depth with the parameter nu zero, which is the eigenvalue of the transport operator that follows from the solution of this transcendental equation. It's a bit inconvenient to solve with root finding, although we can approximate it very accurately with a simple expression. Inside the medium for high albedo materials, we see that the asymptotic solution closely matches the full solution. As the absorption increases and the albedo goes down, the solutions start to diverge a little bit. And you also see that outside the medium, we want our importance function to always be 1 in practice. Once we've sampled a distance that brings us outside of the medium, our future contribution from that point on with certainty is, is 1. Despite these two differences, the method is highly effective across the albedo range. Let's have a look at how we apply the simple importance function to guide our distance sampling. The guided distribution physics times importance function simplifies to a simple modified exponential. This effectively changes the transport coefficient mu2 based on the angle cosine mu that we're moving in and the absorption level of the medium through the eigenvalue nu0. This corresponds to the exponential transform technique that was used in earlier versions of guiding through reactor shields. And in this case, what we get is that longer steps are sampled up towards the boundary to escape, and any time that we're going deeper into the material, uh, shorter steps are get sampled. One important feature that falls out of assuming a pure exponential that scales outside of the medium as well as inside is that the method always simplifies a way to be a depth independent result. Now this is really nice from an implementation perspective because we don't have to know how close we are to the surface to apply this path stretching.
For guiding our direction sampling decisions, we parameterize the set of directions that we'll sample uh, in the space of the half space relative to its axis that points inward into the geometry. So the polar angle mu will be minus one when we're pointing straight out of the material, zero if we're going in any of the lateral dimensions, and equal to one if we're going deeper into the material. The azimuthal angle phi for isotropic scattering will be uniform in both cases because no direction is preferred. Uh, but the polar angle will be sampled from a uniform distribution in the isotropic unguided case, uh, but we will have to modify this distribution based on the guiding. Let's look at how that works. Again, we apply the same rule, uh, the unguided distribution times some importance function. But now we have to be careful about what exactly importance function we use. And the key difference here from the previous result is to think, what is the state of the walk that happens as soon as we make this angle decision? Well, what we do after we choose our angle is then to start a random walk, that is to leave a collision. So we define a slightly different importance function, WO, for outgoing, which is a probability to exit our medium eventually when we leave a collision at some depth x along some known direction with cosine mu. And this will be related to the other importance function by a simple integral. And we can work this out and we derive the guided distribution and we get a simple result, derivative's result, uh, which is a simple function. And this, just as in the case of path sampling, in the guided case tends to send us into directions that move us towards the boundary more often than those that move us deeper into the material. So to summarize, we have two new sampling procedures that we can use to form our subsurface walk. We have new distance sampling and new polar cosine sampling. Uh, these are depth invariant results that we can simply modify our path tracer. And let's have a look at how the paths vary with absorption. Here we show three different absorption levels at the top. In the same scale, light is uniformly arriving normal to the surface and being scattered beneath, and we're visualizing a thousand random paths that are generated with the guided method. And you can see that the paths contain and stay very local in the case that the absorption is high and the albedo is low. The classical sampling algorithm always does these broad set of paths that you see in the bottom, except that most of them, when they arrive back at the surface, are heavily absorbed away to zero. And this is, this is the cause of the variance that we set out to uh, eliminate in the first place. In addition to improving upon the classical method in equal sample count comparisons, this guided sampling is also more efficient because the paths are shorter in that they get to the surface faster. And so if we do a full efficiency analysis comparing inverse time and inverse variance as a notion of efficiency, we see that this 2014 guiding method is much more efficient than the classical sampling for various absorption levels. We've also derived an extension that we'll talk about next that improves upon how angle sampling is, happens near the boundary. And this can give us another order of magnitude of improvement and we see again with equal sample count comparisons, much lower in variance in the guided solution. Let's look at how that works. Let's look at 2D slices of the exact zero variance kernel for our problem. It's derived from uh, importance function based on depth. That is one everywhere outside of the boundary. And it's multiplied by a radially symmetric classical kernel that includes within it the isotropic angle selection, the geometry term, and the exponential fall off. And the product of the two looks something like this. Because we consider absorption here, we see an egg-like shape about our starting position that comes from us tending to guide towards the boundary. But what we also see in the exact solution that isn't in the asymptotic guiding is a discontinuity outside the medium. And this follows from the problem or the main limitation of the asymptotic guiding solution, which is that the importance function is assumed to continue as a growing exponential outside the boundary and is not clamped properly to one. If we look at the exact angle selection decisions that we need to get the perfectly zero variance walk, as we get closer to the boundary, those distributions flatten because all directions very near the boundary escape with equal future contribution. And this is the main limitation of the 
asymptotic guiding. Deriving exactly what these distributions are and important sampling them seems like a very challenging problem. But one thing that we noticed was that with an exit resampling procedure, we can avoid having to do this. And that is by noting that the derivative guiding tends to have us leave the medium with approximately the right probability. It's just that we tend to leave in the wrong directions. So in the course, to in the course notes, we detail uh, exit resampling method, where upon the asymptotic guiding method bringing us out of the medium, we then jump back to the previous location and sample a new guided exit-only procedure that uh, brings the reduced variance that we saw in the previous results. And for more details, please see the course notes on that. To apply the method in practice, given general geometry that doesn't hold with the assumption that the medium is perfectly flat and thick, what we do is we record the surface normal at the entry point and keep a half space aligned to this orientation uh, in memory as we guide the entire walk to exit. And this tends to work pretty well for things like faces, which are mostly optically flat. But you can see that if we use the guided method 100% of the time, that near nostrils and ears and curved regions, we see a spike in these high variant, high frequency fireflies. Combining the classical sampling with the guided sampling using MIS can mitigate a lot of these issues. However, we can also deal with thin objects in the following way. If we can assume the geometry is well approximated by a slab of optical thickness A, and we want to decide between guiding with the derivative sampling procedures towards either the reflected or transmitted hemisphere, we can simply apply the exponential importance function from one side, sum it with the same distribution from the other side of the material, since both can lead to light sources, and from the relatively normalized mixture of the two, we get some probability that we should choose the derivative guiding towards the t-direction, and then some other one minus this probability tells us to go back towards where we entered. And this distribution is a rather simple function based simply on what optical depth we currently are in the medium and the absorption level. You can see here that if we only guide towards the reflected hemisphere, um, for many absorption levels, we get these high spiked fireflies any time that we hit the backside of the material and find the light source. And this two-way guiding is doing a nice job here, reducing variance across the board uh, and avoiding those fireflies. And we also see the efficiency improvement of the method over the classical or single-direction guiding. The asymptotic guiding method can work even when there's Fresnel interactions at the boundary because the asymptotic diffusion length isn't sensitive to the boundary conditions. The importance function just tends to lower uniformly as the IOR goes up. And if you'd like to try more advanced guiding, we fit an approximate function for the importance function since exact results are not known in the literature. The roughness of a dielectric boundary has far less influence, with the rougher surface having very slightly more importance function inside the material. We also note that the zero variance theory can be directly applied as usual, even in the case of so-called non-exponential radiated transfer, where clumpiness in the microstructure causes the attenuation law to deviate from Beer's law. There are two transfer equations that relate to this type of random flight, an integral form from the 1950s and a more recent integral differential equation. And the zero variance theory applies directly if you simply take the integral equation approach, uh, so long as you do it over a collision rate as opposed to radiance, since the two are no longer proportional in the generalized theory. And we talk about this in the course notes, where in particular we look at one form of random walk where the intercollision distance is a gamma 2 distribution instead of an exponential. And it turns out in this exact theory of non-exponential media that we can get a perfectly exact zero variance walk for escaping the 3D half space that is very closely related to the diffusion equation. More details on this method are available in the course notes. In addition to more information, we definitely recommend Hugo Boom's 2008 uh, treatise on zero variance theory 
Uh, and in our course notes, we also talk about aspects such as generalizing the method for anisotropic scattering. Uh, and we can we include derivation and implementation of two perfectly zero variance walks that include all the steps that we've summarized here in complete detail. So you can learn more there. Thanks for listening, and I'll now turn over to Yuri Vorba, who will talk about more path guiding stuff. Thanks. Welcome at the next part of Advances in Monte Carlo Rendering, the legacy of Yaroslav Krivanek. My name is Yuri Vorba. I'm a researcher at Veta Digital and Yaroslav's former student. This part is about path guiding. Path guiding is a sampling technique that is nowadays used also in production. At Weta, we used path guiding to help us with rendering of some movies, recently for example Alita Battle Angel or the BFG. Last year we had even a course on path guiding in production and Jaroslav was part of it. This year I have a set opportunity to talk about path guiding again. But this time I would like to accent Jaroslav's great share on developing this technique. We started working on path guiding during my PhD and since then Jaroslav had numerous publications. He was not just the name on the paper. Sometimes people are appended just because, which shouldn't really happen. But Jaroslav was the exact opposite. He was usually the one strongly pushing the team always visible in the meetings, he contributed with ideas and often he helped tremendously with writing. A common denominator of this course is Jaroslav's search for the one rendering algorithm to render them all, so to say. It might seem elusive goal, but Jaroslav systematically made step by step towards it. Ilian talked about their work on VCM a great algorithm to handle effects due to various materials, glossy, refractive, diffuse, you name it. Yet there is a room for improvements if you change lighting of the scene. So let's illuminate it with the sun. This is not the same scene, but bear with me. Light is occluded and gets into the scene only through a small gap. So Yaroslav thought there is time to look into better important sampling so that we can get more contributing samples. And that's exactly what path guiding is about. It helps us to efficiently sample contributing light paths even in occluded scenes. So in this talk I will go over the list of Yaroslav's publications one by one. He has definitely left visible trace in this line of research and I personally believe that he has inspired others to do research in path guiding. So I will also list some of the numerous follow-up publications. And at the end, I will discuss the impact of Yaroslav's research in production. But let's first look closer at what we mean by path guiding. In path tracing, we need to sample many paths between camera and light sources and average their contributions. In an analog simulation, we construct a random walk vertex by vertex, and we have several types of random decisions. For example, when we reflect from a surface, we import a sample material, that is BSDF, the red vertex in the picture, but such analog sampling can result in low number of paths finding the light source. So what we can do is we can change sampling densities during path sampling. For example, sampling directions within the green cone would certainly increase chances of finding light. We call such change of sampling densities path guiding. What form should the sampling density take? Well, the zero variance theory introduced by Eugene is quite clear. It says that direction should be proportional to product of incident radiance and BSDF and the cosine term. So in guiding, we can import and sample radiance 
and also allocate some samples to separately importance uh, the BSDF. To separately important sample the BSDF. And we can combine both together through multiple important sampling. Some guiding works even take into account the full product, as we will see. Scattering of directions can be also guided within participating media. And such volumes introduce another type of event that can be guided, the distance along the ray. Eugene has talked about this in the context of subsurface scattering. We can also guide stochastic path termination, which directly translates into the distribution of path lengths. Note that in analog simulation, we would use material absorption to terminate paths. However, this is often suboptimal. All those various types of decisions need guiding probability of some form. And if we lean against the zero variance theory, then each of them will include also the radiance term. But this is the quantity we compute in the first place, as we can see from the rendering equation. So how could guiding make anything more efficient? Luckily for us, even just approximation that is cheap to compute can improve Monte Carlo convergence significantly. We were not first to point this out in the context of computer graphics. Pioneering research on directional guiding has been done by Jensen and Lafortune and Willems already in 1995. Other works followed and each of them used a different representation of the incident radiance. Pivotal idea of our research was Yaroslav's observation that reconstruction of radiance can be formulated as machine learning, which opened up a treasury of possible techniques for reconstructing the radiance field. Indeed, we need to learn from sampled paths which are noisy, and we are uncertain if the sampled paths provide the full picture of all important paths. So, and this brings us directly to the next part, Jaroslav's contributions. I will go one by one chronologically. So let's start with our online learning of parametric mixtures from 2014. We formulate learning of incident radiance as a machine learning problem and from the abundant range of techniques, we picked 2D Gaussian mixtures to represent sampling densities proportional to incident light and cosine term. We cache the learned distributions similarly to irradiance caching within the scene. For learning, we use expectation maximization, which we reformulated to accommodate also Monte Carlo weights. In the next work done by Herholtz and colleagues, we leverage properties of Gaussian mixtures to guide according to the full product. Product of two Gaussians is Gaussian and its parameters can be easily calculated. We use this fact to compute the product on the fly, which requires us to represent also BSDFs with Gaussian mixtures. This gives us the benefit in rendering of glossy materials. Right column is guiding, sorry, left column is guiding based only on the radiance cache, while the right column is the full product. Next work I have done with Yaroslav was a joint driven Russian roulette and splitting. While working on directional path guiding, we were originally puzzled that although we guide the sampling, we don't get as good results as we expected. For long paths, guiding didn't even pay off. It turned out that even if we directed paths in right directions, they could not find a light source because Russian roulette based on albedo would simply not let them through. We want to allow such paths and we might even want to split them if they have high chance to bring, or score so to say, high contribution. 
On the other hand, we don't want to allow long paths that have a very small chance of making significant contribution. So we took inspiration from neutron transport and zero variance theory and set the transmission splitting rate Q as a ratio between the expected path contribution given its current state and an estimate of currently rendered pixel i. The expected contribution is based on the knowledge of radiance field in the scene, which is learned progressively. This method helps especially with sampling long paths that bounce multiple times. We have path tracing in the left and guided Russian roulette and splitting in the right. And the method works in synergy with directional guiding. In fact, it uses the same information that is learned for directional guiding, so guided Russian roulette and splitting has negligible overhead. Jaroslav has also worked on extending previously mentioned works for participating media. That is, directional guiding, product sampling and optimal path length selection and splitting. On top of that, it adds guiding of distance sampling along the ray. Traditionally, the distance is sampled only proportionally to transmission and ignores illumination in the scene. All these guided random decisions are framed within the zero variance theory. This theory tells us the form of guiding distributions if we had the precise estimates of the radiance field but we usually don't, plus poorly guided decisions further along the path project to previous vertices. So in the latest work, of which Jaroslav was part of, they propose involving second moment of the radiance estimator. If the nested estimator has variance, this is acknowledged in the formula, and more samples are allocated for that direction. Otherwise, it takes form of the previously proposed distribution, which is proportional to the mean radiance. Note that this is a very fresh work and is presented on this conference, so I highly encourage you to check their presentation. Now I would like to relate Yaroslav's research to other works in the field. I believe that Jaroslav's contributions gave momentum to the path guiding research as we can see on this list of publications produced by other researchers. And this list is not exhaustive. People are still pushing the boundaries of path guiding, which is great. Miller et al. proposed using quad trees cached in KD3 so, um, and use them to represent radiance field. For this structure, Diolatsis et al. proposed recently a method for computing product distribution. To this end, they approximate BSDFs by linearly transformed cosines. And finally, Tank et al. applied quad trees also in participating media. Quite distinct approach to path guiding was taken by Raybold and colleagues. They do not cache to the distributions in the scene. Instead, they selectively cache full paths that cause fireflies in the image. And subsequent paths are guided along those cached paths. In another work, Dam and Keller formulated guiding as reinforcement learning. In a sense, it allows sidestepping from the zero variance theory and propagate an abstract Q quantity rather than radiance. This allows reusing cached approximations for learning. In another work, Miller and colleagues proposed using neural networks to guide paths. Just recently, path guiding has been proposed in the context of real-time rendering. While Dieter Brandt et al. proposed using quad trees to guide one bounce of indirect illumination, Pantaleoni in his framework implements parametric mixtures adapted for GPU. 
Last work I would like to mention is again in the offline rendering context. Rupert and colleagues follow very closely the line of our 2014 paper about online learning of parametric mixtures we had with Yaroslav. They further leverage the properties of parametric mixtures and also improve the learning algorithm. This is also a fresh piece of work, so I again encourage you to check their presentation on this SIGGRAPH conference. Industry impact. Results of Yaroslav's research made it often into production and the same is true for path guiding. As we reported in the path guiding course last year, some forms of path guiding has been used in the VFX industry. At Weta, we implemented path guiding already in 2014. We originally based our implementation on the online learning paper we had with Yaroslav. In the same course, Thomas Müller gives details about implementing their practical path guiding in Disney's Hyperion. At this point, I would like to emphasize guided photon emission, yet another technique used in production at Weta, which actually can be partially attributed to Yaroslav. We learn emission distributions to guide photons for rendering caustics in large underwater scenes. We describe the technique in the path guiding course, uh, in the path guiding in production course but actually it was based on the idea already implemented in the 2014 paper about online learning. This is an example scene from Alita where she enters the shipwreck. We use the guided photon emission for rendering the caustics and cut rays. Just recently, Conte and Kula has introduced their production ready implementation of guided photon emission in Sony's Arnold. And I'm slowly getting to the end of my talk and I would like to conclude by showing this graph which Yaroslav liked quite a bit. It suggests that guiding simple path tracing has a potential to achieve comparable results to guiding more complex combined estimators such as bidirectional path tracing or vertex connection and merging. We have seen that Still, it is advantageous to use guided photons for rendering some effects, for example, underwater caustics, but certainly it suggests that some interconnections and merging techniques are redundant and only cost CPU cycles. Making estimators more lightweight is a current tendency which you might hear about in the next talks and guiding definitely supports this. This takes me all the way back to the one light transport algorithm that Yaroslav was searching for. Lightweight estimators, ideally only path tracing, are highly welcomed in production as they are easier to maintain and to violate physics laws with little tricks. So I personally believe Path guiding in one form or another will be part of the one robust light transport algorithm that would be applicable to any scene. But unlike me, Yaroslav was not that narrow minded and he also looked in other directions like Markov Chain Monte Carlo and this effort will be covered by Martin later in this course. Anyways, we are not there yet and what I'm certain about is that we as a community will greatly miss Yaroslav on the path towards the one algorithm. And that's all from me. Thank you for your attention. Next talk will be given by Petr Vojvoda about sampling lights for next event estimation. Hello. My name is Peter Ravoda, and in this part of the course, I will speak about direct illumination. Direct and indirect illumination are two important components for any physically based render. 
While computation of the indirect component has been traditionally considered a more complex problem, Jaroslav acknowledged that improving the computation of direct illumination could have a substantial impact on the performance, especially in the presence of complex visibility and large number of light sources. Therefore, we developed a method called Bayesian online regression for adaptive direct illumination sampling and presented it on SIGGRAPH 2018. I will explain this method here and show you how to learn light selection probability distributions and how to formulate it as Bayesian regression to ensure robustness even in the early stages of computation. Let me first motivate this work on an example. Monte Carlo rendering algorithms are currently getting more and more popular, but they suffer from noise. Generally, it can take up to several hours for the noise shown on the left to disappear. Traditionally, the indirect illumination component has been considered as the main source of noise, and it has been subject to a lot of research. But in this scene, as well as many other production scenes, it is the direct component which causes the trouble. So let's take a look at it. You can see that there is strong noise in the direct illumination component in this scene. It is caused by using a non-adaptive method for sampling the lights. As it samples lights proportionally to their unoccluded contribution, it wastes a lot of samples on the strong but almost completely occluded sun. A possible solution is to use previous adaptive methods which try to improve sampling based on past samples. An example is now shown on the right. However, while they can decrease the amount of noise significantly, they can also introduce various artifacts and spiky noise because they are based on ad hoc solutions and they tend to overfit to the noisy input data. We proposed a solid theoretical framework based on Bayesian regression that enabled robust adaptive sampling and rendering. In this scene, our solution is more than 500 times faster than the non-adaptive one and we can achieve much better robustness than the previous adaptive sampling method by Ronikian et al. Now, let me give you some background related to the direct illumination problem. Consider a scene with several light sources and geometry. The goal is to calculate the direct contribution of all lights towards a point in the scene. In Monte Carlo rendering, this is achieved by randomly sampling points of the lights and accumulating contributions from these samples. Efficiency of this approach depends mainly on the probability distribution used for drawing the samples. The closer the distribution matches the actual contribution from lights, the less noise in the resulting image. However, finding the best distribution of lights is not easy. It is a complex task, mainly for two reasons. First, there is a problem with light count. As the construction of the sampling distribution scales linearly with the number of lights, it becomes computationally expensive in scenes with many light sources, for example in a city at night. Second problem is the highly uneven light contributions, which are difficult to predict. In particular, occlusion of lights because of scene geometry is usually not known in advance and can have substantial impact on the sampling distribution we strive to find. Let's start with the first problem. In order to improve scalability of our method, we incorporated clustering of lights using the light cuts method by Walter et al. Before the rendering starts, we pre-cluster all lights. Then, during rendering, we always choose clustering according to conservative contribution bounds, such that all lights in a cluster have similar unoccluded contribution to the scene point. Instead of discrete distribution over all lights, we now seek the best discrete distribution over clusters. This way we can greatly reduce the size of the constructed contribution and focus on the second problem, the occlusion. It is usually very hard to find out the occlusion in advance before samples are drawn. Instead, we can first draw the samples and adapt the sampling distribution afterwards. We start with some initial distribution and draw first samples. We compute their contributions and adapt, that is, we compute the sampling distribution accordingly. 
Then we then use this updated distribution for drawing the examples and repeat the process. This is the basic idea behind all adaptive methods. However, there are two open questions. First, what is the optimal target distribution of the clusters we would like to end up with? And second, how exactly should we get there by using the samples? The problem is that Monte Carlo samples are noisy. They provide the correct answer only after averaging many of them. Therefore, it is not safe to rely on them in early stages of rendering. One thing that may help us here is prior knowledge. It expresses our initial belief about the sampling distribution. By combining it with Monte Carlo samples at hand, we get the distribution used for drawing examples. So the second problem boils down to finding a principal way how to combine the prior knowledge with the Monte Carlo samples. In our case, we take advantage of the cluster contribution bounds provided by the clustering and use them as the prior knowledge. They are conservative, but noise-free. Now let's step aside and take a look how adaptivity is handled by the most related work of Ronikian et al. They assume that all clusters can initially contribute the same, so the prior knowledge takes the form of a uniform distribution. Then they get the statistics from samples about cluster contributions in screen space for each pixel. But the per pixel statistics are too noisy, so they additionally gather average statistics over entire blocks of pixels. Then they mix all three distributions. Early on, the uniform distribution is given more weight, and as more samples arrive, the per block and later the per pixel statistics are preferred. But the mixing is done in an ad hoc way, which often results in overfitting and produces image artifacts. We therefore seek a principled solution. Let me now introduce our approach. We make two main contributions corresponding to the two open questions I mentioned. First, we show what should be the optimal discrete probability distribution for choosing a cluster. Our second and main contribution is the use of Bayesian inference to learn this sampling distribution. This gives us a robust solution and allows us to combine cluster contribution bounds with Monte Carlo samples in a principled manner. I start with the first point. What is the probability distribution for choosing a cluster that provides the lowest possible variance? Assume that we have gathered some samples and computed their contribution. The usual approach would be to compute mean contribution of the clusters and make the cluster sampling probabilities proportional to it. We showed in the paper that this traditional choice may be in fact far from optimal. It is important to realize that once we pick a cluster, another random decision follows, which selects a particular light and a sample location on the light. This additional variance has to be addressed by allocating more samples to those clusters that yield highly varying contributions. The final optimal sampling should therefore take into account both the mean contribution, but also the variance of the contributions for each cluster. Note that the second cluster gets much higher probability when its high variance is taken into account. Let me show you a practical example. This scene contains more than 5,000 light sources, so the clusters can be large and complicated. On the left, you can see an inset showing how sampling according to a mean only performs. It undersamples some tricky cluster, which leads to spiky noise. And on the right, you can see that sampling according to both mean and variance eliminates this issue. So our first contribution was showing that the target optimal sampling distribution that we strive to achieve depends on both the mean and variance of cluster contribution. Now I show you how to learn this distribution using Bayesian inference. That is, how to robustly estimate the true mean and variance by combining the cluster contribution bounds and Monte Carlo samples. But why do we bother with Bayesian inference in the first place. 
Why don't we estimate the mean and variance directly using the standard formulas for sample mean and variance? Because these statistics are sensitive to outlier samples and therefore lack the robustness we strive for. I demonstrate it on an example of sample mean. Suppose we have already taken some samples from clusters, computed their contributions, and obtained sampling distribution based on their sample means. Now suppose we have taken a direct emission sample, which happens to be an outlier. Let's take a look how it changes the sample mean. When the contribution of the outlier comes, the sample mean changes abruptly. And so does the sampling distribution. That would have a strong effect on further sampling. One cluster would get sampled very often at the expense of other clusters, leading to increased image noise or even strong fireflies. Therefore, we propose to estimate the mean and variance in Bayesian manner. Instead of the sample mean, we model the distribution of Monte Carlo samples seen so far, while we also use our prior information about the distribution. As a result, when we get an outlier, our model is left affected less abruptly, and so is the sampling distribution derived from it. Resiliency to outlier samples without compromising the ability to learn from the new samples is the basis of our robust solution. So what is this model with prior? It's an analytic probability distribution that approximates the true unknown distribution of data. Let's take a look at our data. We split the scene by a regular grid into a fixed spatial regions, and for each region we compute exactly one light clustering. Our method then operates independently on each cluster region pair. Now I focus on one such cluster region pair data. These are samples collected from one cluster in a single scene region. For each sample we keep track of its contribution and the distance d in the geometry vector. If we plot the gathered data with respect to the distance, one may observe the inverse square falloff of the distance and a number of zero valued, that is, occluded samples. If we take a closer look on how the data are distributed for a particular distance, we can see that the non-zero data follow a curve similar to attribution, and the rest forms a sharp peak at zero. Now we use all these observations to build our model. We model the non-zero samples by normal distribution with parameters k and h. The zero samples are modeled as delta function, and the two parts are mixed together, where the parameter p0 has the meaning of occlusion probability. The inverse squared distance falloff is incorporated by dividing by distance squared. This way we get an adjusted version of the model for every distance. To sum up, our model is a parametric regression model with three parameters, which we denote theta. Having defined our model, we can now estimate the true mean and variance needed for the optimal sampling distribution by mean and variance of the model. However, values of the model parameters are not known and have to be estimated first. And that is where the Bayesian treatment is used. So how does it work? First, we define a prior distribution over the parameters that expresses our initial belief about their values. Then, to find values best explaining the observed data, we express a so-called posterior distribution, that is probability of parameter values after observing the data. It is given by the well-known Bayesian formula. The posterior is proportional to likelihood, this is a product of the model over our data, times the prior. We then maximize posterior with respect to the parameters, which gives us their most probable values given the prior and the observed data. These values are then plugged into the model and the desired mean and variance are computed. The only thing remaining to say is how the prior looks like. The prior is a probability distribution that we believe the three parameters follow without observing any data at all. For convenience, we use conjugate prior, 
which takes form of the beta distribution for p0 and the normal inverse gamma distribution for the parameters k and h. Out of all prior hyperparameters, there is one that stands out, m0. This hyperparameter expresses our a priori belief about the mean of our data and we use the conservative cluster contribution bound for it. So here is where the second source of information is used. And that's it. To sum up, I showed you how to get the desired mean and variance as mean and variance of a parametric model. And that we use one source of information in the prior, the second one in the likelihood, and combine them together in the Bayesian theorem to get a robust estimate of the model parameters. I will now demonstrate our solution in practice. This is a list of all comparisons I will present. I will start with performance testing in a scene with simple occlusion in direct illumination only setting. This is the living room scene from the beginning of my presentation. It is lit mostly by a few small area lights on the ceiling. Only in the left part, sunlight can enter the room through the windows. As you could already see, the non-additive sampling of Wang and Ackerlund does not perform well in this scene. Why is that? The sun is much stronger than the ceiling lights and is therefore sampled much more often even though it is actually occluded. And so most of the samples are wasted. Donikian et al.'s algorithm improves the result significantly as it quickly learns the sun occlusion. On the other hand, it struggles with the ceiling lights. They are covered by shades, which block some of the samples. The method believes these slides are actually completely occluded and consequently undersamples these slides and introduces spiky noise. Our method can also quickly learn the sun occlusion and converges more than 500 times faster than the non additive method. Interestingly, the, in the RMSE pod, we can even observe a higher empirical convergence rate. At the same time, thanks to the Bayesian treatment, our method is robust, does not get confused by the occurred samples, and avoids the spiky noise. So, that was the direct combination. However, in practice, one is usually more interested in images containing both direct and indirect components. This is the same scene, but with the indirect component included. We can see that the strong direct illumination noise of Punk and Akarund dominates also in the complete image. The direct component is definitely the main source of noise in this scene. By using our method in the next event estimation in path tracing, we are able to improve the light sampling on every path vertex and get more than six times speed up. Note that the remaining noise at the bottom right of the image is caused solely by the indirect component and cannot be remedied by our method. Now we stress test the robustness of our method in a scene with complex occlusion. This scene presents a real challenge due to its highly structured illumination, plus there are lights in the other room behind the door. In this part, the method of Van Eckerlund produces a lot of noise again as it wastes samples on the lights behind the door. On the other hand, our method performs well. It is more than 9 times faster, and again we can observe higher empirical convergence rate. And all that without introducing any artifacts in such a complicated illumination setting. Donikian et al.'s method at first also seems to perform well but further inspection would discover small blocky artifacts in the shadows. In this inset, the non-adaptive sampling again does not perform well, but this time also the Dunikian et al. method fails. The illumination coming through the plant leaves is too complex for the ad hoc learning to handle it well. The method overfits and produces square-shaped artifacts. This is exactly the problem of essentially all previous adaptive methods. While they can sometimes provide substantial speedup, they do not fail gracefully, 
and one cannot rely on them. Our Bayesian learning makes our method much more robust and artifact free. Finally, let's test the complex occlusion also with the indirect component. We take a look at the same scene. We can see that the dark emission noise again dominates the complete image when rendered using the method of bunk and account. Our method eliminates it and renders the complete image more than four times faster and without any artifacts. Recall that we divide the scene into regions by uniform grid. I will now show you how this grid resolution affects the algorithm performance. For that purpose, I will use this relatively large scene containing many lines. With our default choice of 64 regions by the shortest grid dimension, our method performs more than three times faster than the method of Bank and Account. So what about other grid resolutions? As it turns out, our method is rather insensitive to the actual grid resolution, and so even much smaller as well as much higher resolutions all perform roughly the same as shown in the plot. This is due to the regression modeling of the distance followed. Without the regression model, we would have to use much higher grid resolution, otherwise we would see sudden noise transitions between regions. To conclude, the main contribution of our work is a Bayesian framework for adaptive Monte Carlo quadrature. It enables exploiting the large potential of the adaptive sampling approach in Monte Carlo methods while avoiding the biggest weakness of the previous attempts, the lack of robustness. We applied this framework on the problem of direct animation sampling. In the process, we derived the optimal sampling distribution, taking variance into account, and developed an unbiased adaptive direct animation algorithm with online learning of light sampling distributions. It is easy to integrate into a path tracer and suitable for interactive rendering. I would like to emphasize that our new framework is not limited to the direct emission though, and we are certain that other applications of adaptive sampling will benefit from it as well. And that is all from me. Thank you for your attention. I now hand over to Ivo Kondapaneni and Pascal Rickman, who will talk about multiple important sampling. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ivo Kondapaneni. I'm a PhD student at Charles University and Yaroslav was my supervisor and mentor. And Yaroslav was uh, the one who got me, uh, Petr Vévoda and Pascal Gritman together in order to work on MIS to understand MIS weaknesses and strengths. So now uh, Pascal will give you highlight of our research. Hi. I'm Pascal Krittmann, currently a PhD student at Saarland University. I worked with Jaroslav for about two years on various topics, including multiple board perception. In this part of the course, we will discuss recent advances for multiple important sampling, or MIS. MIS was invented 25 years ago. It had such a tremendous impact that Eric Veach was awarded the Scientific and Engineering Award in 2014. Hardly any work has gone into trying to improve upon the original weighting functions since then. But because Jaroslav was a kind of guy who always wanted to improve everything, we ended up trying to improve MIS. When designing the run algorithm that can render all scenes at the lowest level of noise possible, MIS plays an important role. It is unlikely that we will find a single sampling technique that is robust and efficient enough to form the one algorithm. Instead, we usually have multiple techniques that complement each other. Here, for example, technique A performs poorly at the focus illumination from the sun, where technique B is good at. On the other hand, the areas in shadow, which are illuminated by the mostly uniform sky, are better handled by technique A. MIS achieves a better result by combining the two. While it is a great tool, MIS is not perfect. Let us look at a different part of the scene. Again, we combine the same two techniques. On the packaging, one is almost perfect, the other performs poorly. Unfortunately, MIS wastes samples on the poorly performing technique, resulting in a lower efficiency. So the question is, can we do better than that? Before we answer that question, let's recap some background. When rendering an image like this one, 
we compute an integral for each pixel. We integrate over all paths that connect the pixel to a light source. Typically, we use Monte Carlo integration. Let's illustrate that in one view. To integrate the function f, we can take samples from some distribution p. We can then average these samples to obtain an estimate of our integral. The closer our p is to f, the lower the variance will be. But we usually cannot find a single p that satisfies that goal. MIS can help us. There might be another technique p2, suited for sampling a different part of f. To use MIS, we generate another set of samples from that density, forming another estimator of the same integral. We can then weight the samples by awaiting function w, and if we sum out the weighted estimates, we achieve a new combined estimator, hopefully with lower variance. This basic recipe can be improved upon in multiple ways. Most previous work has tackled the question of better sample allocation. Distributing the available sample budget better can improve efficiency. Less attention has been on finding better weighting functions. There are only a few domain-specific enhancements to your original heuristics. A novel avenue for improvement is adapting the sampling densities themselves. In the following, we will discuss the truly optimal ways, show how to enhance MIS with variance estimates, and present a method to fine-tune the sampling distributions. We start with our research on optimal MIS weights. We will show that the balance heuristic is further from the optimum than what has been believed so far. The balance heuristic is very popular in the context of Monte Carlo rendering. It is very easy to compute, as it is only based on the sampling densities and the number of samples. Apart from their simplicity, the authors of the original work were able to prove that these weights are also close to optimal. According to them, no other weighting functions can achieve much lower variance. For these reasons, the balance heuristic has been used as a de facto universal solution. Let's look at a simple example. We combine two techniques to render direct illumination. In this part of the image, one is almost perfect, while the other performs poorly. Unfortunately, the balance heuristic keeps some of the error of the worst technique. In general, while it improves robustness, it can reduce efficiency. In contrast, our optimal weights achieve a 10 times lower error. How can we get this 10 times speed up when the balance heuristic was supposed to be almost optimal? The reason lies in the fact that the variance bounds actually do not hold, at least not in a fully general setting. This observation forms the first of our contributions. When deriving the bounds, the authors considered the variance of an estimator split into two terms, m1 and m2. By minimizing the m2 part, they obtained the balance heuristic. On the right, you can see the plot of the variance versus total number of samples when using the balance heuristic. Then, the authors bounded the second term from above, which gave them a conservative estimate of how much better the best possible weighting functions might be with respect to the balance heuristic. In other words, no alternative weighting function should yield an estimator with variance below the dashed blue line. However, we investigated their derivations further and realized that they assumed only positive weights restricted to the interval 0 and 1. But the MIS framework allows for weights which are not restricted. This simple fact has not been recognized up until now. Removing the restriction of positive weights invalidates Veach's bounds and it opens the possibility that the truly optimal MIS weights have much lower variance. So how can we obtain the optimal weights? Our starting point is again the MIS variance formula. But instead of minimizing just the first part, we minimize everything in terms of weighting functions. That gives us the provably optimal weights, which can have negative values, and we observe that in many cases. Let's look at the actual weights themselves. They include the balance heuristic as part of their formulation, and they also contain the integrand f, which is very uncommon among combination strategies that are widely used. The formula also contains some coefficients, which we denoted alpha. There are as many of these alphas as there are sampling techniques. They are the solution to a linear system, which is represented by a matrix A and a vector B. The individual elements forming the matrix A resemble projections of sampling techniques onto themselves, and the elements of vector B resemble a projection of F into a system of sampling techniques. We also found that there is a close relationship between the optimum MIS weights and an optimal control variable. If we take the formula for our optimal weights and plug them into an MIS estimator, then the resulting estimator formulation has the structure of a control variant. In our case, the control variant G is a linear combination of the sampling techniques. So let's look at some results when applying these weights in practice. We explore two directions, applying the weights to standard techniques and designing new ones. Let's discuss the results for standard techniques. I will use the staircase scene again, 
where the scene is illuminated by two lights. We must randomly select one of the lights and compute its contribution. Suppose you have a technique which samples lights according to the unoccluded contribution. It works nicely in places illuminated by both lights, but much worse when light occlusion occurs. The other technique distributes samples across the lights uniformly, and we observe the opposite. It works much better in shadows. When we combine the two techniques using the balance heuristic, we no longer see the excessive noise from the trained technique in the shadow. But in unoccluded regions, the result is now compromised by the uniform technique. Using the optimal weights, we can see much better results, and we can see they even outperform the individual techniques. The reason behind this is that the optimal weights act as control variants. The control variant functionality of the optimal weights also pointed us to alternative sampling techniques, which nobody would normally think of in an MIS setting. The control variant G that they form is a linear combination of the sampling techniques. So the closer that linear combination is to the integrand, the better the result will be. Therefore, we design sampling techniques that makes their linear combination a better fit to the integrand. Let me explain that on this 2D example. Let's assume we have the following sampling techniques. The spherical technique, which samples the light's projection onto the hemisphere, and the uniform area technique, which samples the light's area. For a light parallel to the surface, a combination of the uniform and spherical techniques can compensate for the cosine factor and be closer to the integrand. This assumption breaks when the light is at an angle, because then the spherical and uniform techniques are almost the same. So we introduce a new technique, which samples the parallel projection of the light source. Now let me show you how these techniques perform in a simple scene, the dining room, which is illuminated by a single rectangular light source above the table. The spherical technique is quite good, the uniform technique performs a bit worse, and the parallel technique performs very, very badly because it actually doesn't make much sense in an important sampling setting. What happens when we combine these using our optimal MIS weights? On the left, we can see the spherical technique with 20 samples per pixel. The other two images replace 10 of those samples by one of the other two techniques. If we combine spherical and uniform, we get a small speed up, especially on the surfaces that are parallel to the light source. Now, if we combine a spherical and a parallel technique, we get an even greater speed up, even on surfaces that are at an angle with the light source. Of course, the optimal weights also have limitations when used in practice. We need to estimate the weights based on the previous samples. So if we don't have enough samples that can yield an unstable linear system and produce some salt and pepper noise. Additionally, when the number of samples is very large, then the optimal weights can become prohibitively expensive. That's because the cost of solving this linear system is quadratic in a number of techniques. The overhead of the optimal weights can be too high for some complex use cases like binary path tracing. So in the following, we will discuss a cheaper, although not optimal, alternative. Bidirection path tracers are a common use case for MIS. They are used for scenes with difficult indirect illumination, like the light shining through the lampshade onto the wall here. But such scenes can also contain simpler direct illumination, for example on the table. That simple direct illumination is captured well by a simple path tracer. The bidirectional path tracer, on the other hand, uses those exact same samples and adds additional ones coming from the lights. So one would expect it to perform the same or better than the path tracer. It's actually worse. The problem is that common MIS heuristics ignore certain variance reduction effects like stratification. In the following, we'll first discuss why that is the case and then show how injecting variance estimates can help solve the problem. Why can stratification be problematic for MIS? Let's look at the simple and common example of image plane stratification. We say that samples are stratified over the image plane if each and every pixel in our image receives exactly one sample. That stratification greatly reduces the variance. Now, in contrast, unstratified samples are those where you distribute the same number of samples over the entire image, which means that some pixels don't get any samples at all, while others might get multiple ones. Now, in a bidirectional path tracer, you have some sampling techniques, like the light tracer that traces paths from the light source and connects them to the camera, which you can't stratify on the image plane. But why is image plane stratification a problem for the balance heuristic? Let us compute the effective density 
that n times p term that's used by the balance heuristic in a simple example. With one sample per pixel and uniform sampling, the effective density is 1 times 1 over the area of the pixel. If all pixels are of the same size, that means the effective density is the number of pixels divided by the total image area. Without stratification, we have the same total number of samples, so number of pixels is our number of samples. And if they're all distributed uniformly, then their probability density will be 1 over image area. So in total, that's the exact same value that the stratified version is using as well, which means that the balanced power and maximum heuristic will assign the exact same weights no matter if there is stratification or not. And they will completely disregard the effect that stratification has on the variance. An alternative to MIS is weighting based on the variance. Let's assume we have the images of two techniques and their variance estimates, shown in false color here. We can weight the techniques based on their variances to get an image that is better than either one alone. Why do we use MIS and not only this variance-based weighting approach? Well, MIS allows us to weight samples individually, which can be much, much more efficient than a coarse per pixel weighting. Also, we don't usually know the exact variances. And estimating the variances can lead to some nasty artifacts in the image. Whereas MIS is using only deterministic and well-known quantities like number of samples and the probability density. But variance-based weighting has one huge benefit, which is that it accounts for anything that affects the variance by definition, which MIS with the balance heuristic does not. So what can we do? Well, we can use the exact same idea that MIS is based on and just combine the two. Now, in order to find a good way to combine these two approaches, we will look again at the equation of the variance of a single technique that's combined with MIS, which is shown here. Now, as we've explained before, the optimal MIS weights would minimize the full term, or rather its weighted contribution to our combined estimator. In contrast, the balance heuristic only considers this first integral that we have here and ignores some residual term, let's call it RT. Now the problem is that RT can be very different. In the simple case, it is the squared mean divided by the number of samples. However, if you have stratified samples, it becomes the sum of the squared per stratum means. And in general, with any type of correlation, there is some covariance term in there that can be almost arbitrary. Now, if you combine different techniques where this RT term differs significantly, then mayhem can happen as we've seen before in this simple binary pathways example. Now, what we propose to do is we compute a ratio between the term that the balance heuristic considers, this integral that you can see here in the numerator, and we divide that by the actual variance using estimates of both quantities. Then we inject that ratio into the balance heuristic by multiplying it on top of the effective density. Now the effect of doing that is shown in this simple graph here. If the variance of a technique is very low, then we will significantly increase its weight. However, if it's very high, then our additional factor drops off rapidly towards one which means that we won't change the balance heuristic at all. And that's a good thing, because the balance heuristic actually works reasonably well if you combine only high variance techniques. So let's look at some results. An extreme case is this classical MIS test scene. We are looking at the most boring part of it, the diffuse wall behind the lights. The path tracer handles the simple direct illumination there quite well. Bidership path tracing with the balance heuristic goes horribly wrong. Well. One might think now, hey, the power heuristic was invented to handle such low variance cases. Well, the power heuristic performs even worse. It is also based on the effective density, which does not capture image plane stratification. With our approach, we achieve a robust result that is no longer worse than the path tracer. What's more important than improving on the balance heuristic is not breaking things when it actually works well. In this scene, the path tracer struggles at the heavily occluded direct illumination. Adding the bidirectional samples with the balance heuristic works reasonably well because all our techniques have high variance. 
Again, the power heuristic performs worse, this time by assigning a too high weight to the path tracer, whereas our technique produces the almost exact same result as the balance heuristic with some marginal improvements here and there. What's the benefit of injecting the variance estimates into the balance heuristic? Well, in this comparison, we can see in the top row and bottom row, the exact same variance estimates used in combination with the exact same set of samples. Only the top row is using our combined approach, whereas the bottom row is using only the variance estimates themselves. And you can see that we avoid all those nasty artifacts and outliers that still happen if you use the variance estimates on their own. So it's a much more robust way to use those estimates. In conclusion, we have a method that makes complex MIS combinations more robust by injecting variance estimates. The cost is just a bit of extra memory per technique, and we will get much better results in extreme cases while not breaking anything in other cases. So far, we were optimizing the weights of a given fixed combination of techniques. The approach we will discuss next instead modifies a technique to perform better in an MIS combination. When applied to this example we have shown before, doing so can result in an almost three times faster rendering. What's even better, it only requires three simple lines of code. Let's illustrate the idea in 1D. In rendering, it often happens that we have one technique P1 that is in many regions similar to the integrand, but undersamples it in some other regions. We also have a second technique, P2, imposed by the renderer, which is not possible to modify. For example, the SDF important sampling. The MIS combination of these two techniques, using the standard balance heuristic and the same number of samples for each technique, will give us a combined density shown in purple. And as we can see, the resulting combined PDF is far from perfect. It still oversamples some parts of the integrand and, consequently, undersamples others. To improve this, we first realized that the technique P2 imposed by the renderer already samples some parts of the integrand well. What we would like to do is to modify the sampling technique P1 to focus more on parts that are undersampled by the other technique. And that is exactly what MIS combination does. It modifies one of the sampling techniques with respect to MIS. Thanks to MIS combination, the resulting PDF, here drawn in red, is a much closer match to the integrand than when using the unmodified sampling techniques. Using MIS compensation decreases the estimator's variance. What is the idea of MIS compensation? We formulate the problem as follows. We start with a one-sample MIS estimator, using the balance heuristic with an equal number of samples allocated to each technique. The denominator then corresponds to the combined PDF given by the balance heuristic. Our goal is to ideally obtain a zero variance estimator meaning that the estimate will be equal to the integral for any number of samples. We want to achieve that goal by making p1 a free function to optimize. Now what is the solution for p1 under this problem setup? Simple algebra yields a formula for p1 by taking the ideal zero variance PDF and subtracting the fixed density p2. Unfortunately, that formula can give us an invalid PDF. It can be unnormalized or even negative. To ensure a valid PDF, we clip to zero and renormalize. While this is no longer the actual optimum, the paper shows that this solution gets very close to it. Let's illustrate one of the applications of MIS compensation, image-based lighting. Realistic illumination can often be defined by an HDR image that is spherically mapped around the scene. To compute the illumination at a point X, we take the emission from the HDR, multiplied by the BRDF, the cosine, and the visibility term. We then integrate that over all incoming directions on hemisphere. This integral is typically estimated using an MIS combination of two techniques. One is proportional to the HDR map emission and is usually implemented as a tabulated PDF. The second is proportional to the BRDF cosine product and its PDF is given by an analytical formula. To apply MIS compensation, we optimize one of these techniques. Since modifying a tabulated PDF is simple, we choose to optimize the first technique. A new PDF is computed according to the MIS compensation formula. While the solution is close to optimal, it is not yet practical. The problem is that it contains the target integral value and depends on both the surface position x and the outgoing direction. So it's not very efficient. 
To get a more efficient solution, we can add three simplifying assumptions. First, that all surfaces are diffuse, that we average over all surface normals, and that visibility does not matter. This yields a much simpler formula. We subtract the average value from each HDR pixel, which is not only efficient, but also trivial to implement. In effect, this enhances the contrast of the HDR, focusing more on the brightest regions, leaving the darker ones for BSDF sampling to explore. When applying this to a scene that satisfies our assumptions, mostly diffuse surfaces, little occlusion, we can achieve an almost three times faster rendering. But even if the assumptions are violated, like in this scene, which features heavy occlusion, we still observe improvements. The same holds for glossy surfaces. Here we see a ball rendered at different levels of glossiness illuminated by the same HDR map. While the biggest improvements are visible for closely diffused surfaces, at higher levels of glossiness the result is at least never worse than basic MS, so it's not only efficient, it's also robust. What's more, we can also apply the same trick to other applications. For instance, the path guiding approaches discussed earlier in this course. When guiding, we learn a distribution at a point in the scene. The learned distribution is usually combined via MIS with BSDF importance sampling. Applying the same simple contrast enhancement trick can again yield visible improvements. This concludes the MIS part of this course. The key take home message here is that MIS is not a solved problem. Simple tricks like injecting variance information or adapting the PDFs can yield visible improvements. The optimal solution can be an order of magnitude faster than a balance heuristic. And that leaves a lot of room to explore and we are curious what cool ideas you might come up with there. In the next part of the course, Martin will tell you more about Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Hello, my name is Martin Schick. And in this part of the course, I will discuss Markov chain Monte Carlo, an alternative approach to the one rendering algorithm that can render any scene efficiently. Markov chain Monte Carlo, or just MCMC, can be often more efficient than the ordinary Monte Carlo. Consider this scene, which is lit from the outside, and so light must travel through the blinds into the classroom. The result of ordinary Monte Carlo on the left is still noisy after one hour of rendering while well, MCMC's result on the right side is much cleaner. Even though MCMC often converges faster than ordinary Monte Carlo methods, it was rarely used in practice. This is because MCMC suffers from non-uniform and unpredictable convergence. I demonstrate this issue on this ring scene. Here we can see a glossy ring illuminated by a small light source, which creates caustics on the floor. These caustics are reflected in the mirror behind the ring. Here, an MCMC algorithm oversamples sunlight transport, while it fails to discover other. The goal of our research was therefore to develop a new MCMC algorithm which would have more predictable convergence, while it would converge faster than ordinary Monte Carlo in difficult scenes. Before we discuss how we approach this goal, let me give you some brief introduction to MCMC. MCMC is a general technique for generating samples from an unanalyzed density defined by so-called target function. Given a state space from which we want to draw samples and a target function, MCMC algorithm defines a Markov chain whose states are the desired samples. Since the state of Markov chain depends on the previous one, the generated samples are correlated. To ensure the samples distribution is proportional to the target function, one can apply one of the MCMC algorithms. Probably the most famous one is Metropolis Hastings. The algorithm works as follows. First, it generates a proposal V using some proposal distribution that depends on an initial sample U0. The proposal is then accepted with a probability depending on the ratio of the target function values. If the proposal V is rejected, a new sample 
u1 is equal to the previous sample u0. Another proposal v is generated using a distribution that depends on u1. In the case of acceptance, the new sample u2 is said to be equal to the proposal v. This way we continue until we have enough samples. Let us now discuss how we can utilize MCMC in light transport simulation. MCMC was introduced to light transport by Weech and Guibas in their algorithm Metropolis Light Transport. In this case, the state space equals the path space and the target function is equal to path contribution. Thus, MCMC generates light transport paths almost according to their contribution to the image. The almost is important here since the desired samples distribution is only reached after infinitely many samples has been drawn. Let us look how the algorithm works in the schematic view of the classroom scene. MCMC will randomly generate proposal paths until it finds and accepts one contributing path. Then it uses localized proposal distributions to generate more contributing paths. Such proposals are often called path mutations. Using these mutations, we are exploiting the original green path in order to locally explore an important region of the path space. This local exploration is behind the effectiveness of MCMC. But excessive local exploration can lead to the aforementioned convergence issues. This is especially visible in animations where we can see random appearance of image features. The cause of overexploitation is insufficient global exploration. It is failure to discover and frequent the sample all the important areas in the scene. This is often the case with the highly varying target functions, such as the one equal to path contribution. Let us now look at the target function that has several separate modes. In this case, a Markov chain may get stuck in one of the modes oversampling it while not discovering the other modes. This is because the discovery of new important parts is usually done using some uninformed global mutation whose proposals are often rejected since they are very likely uh, since they very likely have a low target function value. In the past, most of the research works on MCMC in light transform simulation focused on improving local exploration. But the major issue of global exploration remained unaddressed. In our research, we therefore focused on improving global exploration in MCMC and developing new algorithms which exhibit more uniform convergence. We believed that solving this issue would allow adoption of MCMC into practice. In the following slides, I will discuss three of our works that tackle the issue of unpredictable MCMC convergence. Let us start with our first paper, Improving Global Exploration, in MCMC light transport simulation. In this research, we have approached the issue of insufficient global exploration by utilizing replica exchange and tempering. A replica exchange allows for combination of several Markov chains with different target functions. So we can have a chain with a target function equal to path contribution for efficient local exploration, and another chain that uses less varying target function which allows for easier global exploration of the whole state space. The transition from the more varying target function to the smoother one is often called tempering. When utilizing more Markov chains, we can mutate them separately. Or to enable benefits of both target functions, we exchange the current samples of the corresponding chains. The exchange is accepted with a probability that depends on the target function values. In this example, the chain with the target function F1 discovered a new mode due to the exchange. In the algorithm, we then interleave the exchanges and separate mutations of the chains. To ensure that the exchange is accepted with high probability, it is common to use more chains with increasingly more template target functions. The exchanges are then performed only between the neighboring chains. In our research, we further optimize the exchanges among the chains. 
while replica exchange was used before in light transport simulation. It was either not applied to improve global exploration, or it was used without effective tempering. In our research, we have tried to maximize replica exchange potential by focusing on both of its key components, target function tempering and exchange strategies. Before I discuss how we approach tempering, note that our method is built on top of primary sample space Metropolis Light Transport. Instead of mutating paths in the path space, this algorithm mutates a sample in so-called primary sample space. And this sample is then utilized as a random vector during path sampling, which constructs the path in the path space. Mutating the sample results in the path being mutated. This allows us to utilize path sampling techniques from different existing light transport algorithms. In our MCMC method, we utilize path sampling techniques from bidirectional path tracing, which traces a path from the camera and path from the light source, and then connects them. The amount of energy carried through the connection depends on the bidirectional scattering distribution function, BSDF, that defines the reflection profile of the material. In the case of glossy materials, the BSDF will have a sharp lobe and will be a major source of target function variation. We therefore gradually widen BSDF lobes, which leads to a smoother target function. We wanted to find the best strategy for exchanging the samples of the chains. For that purpose, we have tested several existing strategies, but we have also developed our own strategies. From synthetic and rendering tests, we have determined that the best option is to use our own strategy called Important Sampled Permutations. This strategy allows to permute the current samples of all the chains at once. The permutation is always accepted and thus efficiently combines the chains. Let us now look at the results. We can see that after 15 minutes of rendering, an MCMC algorithm, primary sample space metropolis light transport, failed to sufficiently sample some of the reflective caustics, while others are oversampled. The result of manifold exploration light transport seems to be more converged due to its superior local exploration mutation, but again, some of the transport is oversampled, while other is undersampled. While the result of our method is quite noisy, it contains most of the difficult transport due to its improved global exploration. If you look at the positive-negative difference with the reference, we can see that our method delivers more uniform red-green noise than the other methods due to its more regular convergence. We can observe the improved global exploration of our method in this convergence comparison, while our method on the left discovers some light transport randomly, unlike the ordinary Monte Carlo algorithm on the right, its convergence behavior is more uniform compared to primary sample space metropolis in the middle. Let us move to our second research, a spatial target function for metropolis photon tracing. Here we focus on improving stochastic progressive photon mapping with MCMC while achieving uniform convergence. Let us begin with a quick overview of stochastic progressive photon mapping or just SPPM. The algorithm starts by generating rays from the camera and recording the hit points, so-called measurement points. If the ray hits highly glossy surface, we continue tracing until we find a diffuse enough surface where the measurement point is stored. Then, SPVM traces paths from light sources. On each diffuse bounce of the light path, it performs density estimate. Each measurement point that falls into the density estimate radius propagates light contribution back to the image. Due to path reuse and spatial regularization inherent to density estimation, SPPM is very effective at handling effects like caustics or reflective caustics. But the algorithm's efficiency will drop in scenes where it is difficult to find a contributing path. For example, if most of the light paths fail to reach the region visible from the camera due to occlusion. An example of such scene is here. All the light is coming from the outside, so most of the light paths never find the interior. Especially the dark part of the scene shown in the red inset is very noisy in SPVM's result. 
to improve SPPM's performance. Hachisuka Ensen used MCMC to trace light paths towards the visible region. They choose a very simple target function, so-called binary visibility. The function is simply zero for non-contributing paths and one for all contributing paths. MCMC delivers more light paths to the visible region and thus significantly improves the result. But we can see that there is more noise in the red inset compared to the blue one. The algorithm still distributes more light paths to the more lit regions, which leads to non-uniform convergence. This is an issue we have addressed in our research. Under some simplifying assumptions, we can prove that an image has uniform relative error if each measure measurement point has the same probability of receiving a non-zero contribution from a light path. This is achieved if the target function value is equal to the inverse density of uniformly sampled light paths. To compute such target function, we do the following. We subdivide the scene into spatial regions. We trace light paths and record how many of their vertices, shown in yellow, land in each region. We then update the target function, giving higher value to cells with lower photon count and zero value to regions without measurement points. We continue tracing light paths and updating target function throughout the whole algorithm. As you can see, our method significantly reduces noise compared to the previous methods, even in the dimly lit area of the scene in the red inset. In this equal time comparison, we show that our method has not only low lower relative image error compared to the previous method, but the error is also more uniform in the whole image. Unfortunately, since our method is based on SPPM, it can't efficiently handle some types of paths. Here you can see a trace scene containing glossy materials. After one hour of rendering with our method, the scene is still very noisy. In our next paper, a robust light transport simulation via metropolis bidirectional estimators, we have therefore focused on developing a more robust algorithm that would utilize MCMC to handle all types of scenes while not exhibiting convergence issues. One of the methods that robustly handles many types of transport paths is vertex connection emerging or just VCM. This ordinary Monte Carlo algorithm was already presented in this course and thus I will just quickly demonstrate VCM on the schematic view of the classic trace scene. VCM creates the paths by combining a path from the camera and path from light source. It combines the paths using connections, where any of the light path vertices can be connected to any camera path vertex. It can also combine the paths using density estimation as in SPPM, in this case called merging. Unlike SPPM, VCM allows merging at any vertex. This increases robustness in the case of glossy glossy transport. But like SPPM, VCM becomes quite inefficient in scenes where it is difficult to find a contributing path, for example, due to occlusion. In our research, we combine VCM with MCMC in one robust algorithm. MCMC enables efficient exploitation of paths, while VCM techniques, connections and merging, effectively handle difficult transport. Again, we built on top of primary sample space metropolis light transport, but here we use all the techniques of VCM. Due to better path sampling, the target function equal to path contribution has lower variation. This significantly reduces the issues connected to poor global exploration. To further improve global exploration, we again apply a replica exchange, but here it is sufficient to only use two target functions. The main target function equal to path contribution for better local exploration. And the binary visibility target function is non zero for all contributing paths. We could use MCMC to generate both paths from light light sources and from the camera. But we have found that using independent stratified sample for camera paths leads to better results. And thus, we only use MCMC to generate paths from light sources to ensure effective exploitation. 
We demonstrate the results of our method in this kitchen scene, which contains glossy materials on the kitchen counter. This scene is unlit from the outside. The light therefore needs to go through a window before it reaches the visible region. The result of VCM is very noisy even after one hour of rendering. This is due to VCM's inability to deliver enough light paths to visible region. While the MCMC algorithm Manifold Exploration Light Transport delivers more clean result due to local exploration, the resulting image contains many artifacts. These are caused by poor global exploration. We can see that the result of our method only introduces some high frequency noise comparable to ordinary Monte Carlo due to better global exploration. The noise level is also much lower compared to VCM due to local exploration. We can also compare temporal coherence of our method to manifold exploration light transport. The result of our algorithm is better behaved and only contains high frequency noise, which can be easily denoised. The combination of VCM and MCMC has proven to be practical enough to be adopted in production renderer. More specifically, we use it in Corona Renderer to enable the users to efficiently render caustics. There are some differences in the practical implementation. Mainly, the algorithm does not require to set up any parameters and is more lightweight. It uses MCMC only when it is necessary to avoid overhead. Here is an example of what the users can achieve with Corona's caustic solver. So this concludes our research that I want to discuss here. For the readers interested in learning more about MCMC technique in light transport simulation, I suggest reading our survey. As for the newest development, I recommend the papers shown on the slide. While our work has significantly improved global exploration, the issue is far from being solved. One of the biggest problems is the use on uninformed mutation to explore the state space. We believe the designing informed or learned global mutations could further improve global exploration. There is a certain similarity with path guiding and thus interesting avenue is the combination of path guiding and MCMC. That's all from me and I thank you for attention.